So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Joseon History Society uh, Zoom event. And my name is Sean Han, and I will be the moderator of today's talk. And on behalf of the Joseon History Society, I want to thank you all for joining in today's Zoom event uh, and uh, sharing your time and efforts. And most importantly, I want to thank uh, Dr. Wolf Siversen for giving us this rare opportunity to hear about his research. And I believe some of the participants in today's Zoom meeting are not familiar with uh, what the Joseon History Society is, who we are, what we do. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, provide a little context of today's event and uh, the mission of our organizations and what we do. The Joseon History Society is a public learned society uh, promoting the study, research, and teaching of Korea's past. Uh, with that mission, our goal is to foster an active community of researchers and learners of Korea's past. We connect scholars working both outside and inside the professional academia across disciplines. Our main goal is to provide opportunities for scholars who are operating independently or are otherwise under resources to share research and generate uh, their uh, network. We have two projects ongoing. So first one is the translation and consultation network. And the second one we do is uh, the public Zoom talk. So we encourage you to visit our official website, chosunhistorysociety.org. And please visit our website and take a look for more details. So you can find the, uh, the Zoom link, of, I'm sorry, uh, the website link of our uh, official website. And uh, many of you asked about our name, Joseon, Joseon History Society. So whether everything that we care and promote are only limited to the Joseon Dynasty period, that is not true. Uh, we have a very broad definition of what Joseon can mean. We define Joseon as a uh, signifier that can connect scholars across disciplines who works on various topics about Korea's past. Uh, that includes ancient history, medieval history, colonial period, and authoritarian period, post-authoritarian period, or contemporary history. So uh, without further ado, uh, I will introduce today's speaker, uh, Rolf, and then uh, we will start. So today's speaker, Dr. Rolf Siversen, uh, is an independent scholar uh, of modern Korea and Japanese history. Dr. Rolf Siversen received PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania. And at Penn, his research focused on civil administration in Manchu Kuo and its impact on state building in South Korea. His interest includes the history of state, global and transnational political movements and critical biography. Alongside his dissertation, uh, Dr. Rolf Siversen's work has been recognized by peer scholars and published by the International Journal of Asian Studies titled From Chimera's Womb, The Manchu Kuo Bureaucracy and Its Legacy in East Asia, which came out in 2020. One of his goal outside the academia is to introduce Korean history and historical concept to a wider audience in the public. Last year, uh, Rolf was invited to give a talk in a podcast series called What is Asia? to introduce the subject of Korean collaborators in Manchuria and Korea. Uh, Rolf Siversen is currently developing a multimedia project that explores post-colonial Korean society through the lens of crime reporting in occupied Seoul. He's also a mentor and advocate for historians working outside of academia. So the title of today's talk is Calling an Audible on Civil Service Reform, Bureaucrats at State Builders under Seungman Ri. The term calling an audible comes from US football game, indicating a moment when a quarterback changes the play at the last minute 
And uh, this is a term that I just learned from this title. Uh, well, please welcome Dr. Rolf Siversen. Uh, and uh, Dr. Rolf Siversen, uh, the floor is yours. So please uh, present whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you, oops, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's a rare opportunity that I get these days to talk about Korean history with, uh, with people. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to having this opportunity to share some of my research and hopefully get some uh, useful feedback on it. So uh, the presentation that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is uh, part of a broader project that I've been really interested in looking at uh, the period of the 1950s as a process of state building, particularly looking at it from the perspective of government institutions. Uh, in my presentation today, I'll be specifically talking about an organization called the Office of General Affairs. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and how that organization, uh, as sort of the reference to calling it audible, made a number of uh, different types of attempts and different decisions uh, to try and carry out a process of civil service reform in the 1950s, despite having uh, significant institutional barriers to enacting civil service reform at the time. So why bureaucrats or why bureaucracy? Um, bureaucrats are a really interesting topic uh, that come up quite a bit in Korean history, uh, particularly both in sort of ancient and past history, uh, early modern history, and in the modern period. But it really in the modern period, a lot of that discussion is centered around the military regime. And with this discussion today and my larger interests, I'm really focused on sort of decentering the military regime from that discussion of bureaucrats. Uh, part of the reason that the military regime, I think, is so central to that discussion is that focus on economic development and bureaucrats as drivers of economic development. And this comes from a lot of the literature about the, the development, the developmental state uh, in the late 20th century. Um, and not to sort of discount that, it's a lot of very interesting and compelling scholarship. But what re really interests me is looking at bureaucrats and bureaucracy as a larger project of state building. And when taking it outside of that sort of military regime lens and that economic development lens, you can see how bureaucrats uh, were really engaged in this process of constructing the state from the remnants of past influences, as well as new influences in a really dynamic period that happens in the 1950s in particular. And so today I'll be giving an example of one, uh, the way bureaucrats in one specific agency went about that process of trying to form the state. So why the Office of General Affairs in particular? So the Office of General Affairs, and I'll give a caveat here, this is, uh, I'll be using the name, the Office of General Affairs, but the name of this organization actually changed several times between 1950 and 1962. Uh, but just for the sake of consistency, I'll be calling it the Office of General Affairs, which is in part helped by the fact that the official English translation of the name never changed, despite the Korean being changed. So the Office of General Affairs uh, was an organization that had quite a broad range of, uh, of roles within the South Korean government in the 1950s. Uh, but the main one I'll be focusing on here today is its public administration functions. So the office was in charge of things like personnel policy, uh, personnel classification, payroll and benefits, employment screening, training issues, uh, broadly uh, uh, all of the types of things that are used to regulate the South Korean civil service itself. Um, it's probably best known at the time as the office though that was in charge of uh, administering the cabinet, minute me uh, cabinet meeting. Uh, that is the director of the Office of General Affairs was the person who actually wrote down the minutes for all cabinet meetings. Um, and so in that respect, it was kind of a, he was kind of a glorified secretary. I'll get into a, that a little bit later, but um, just to say it was very important for sort of the public administration functions. What's also interesting about this particular organization is that bureaucrats who were working in the Office of General Affairs in the 1950s uh, had an unusually long tenure. Uh, at the time, it was not unusual for public officials to be moved around from job to job uh, having a relatively quick transition between them. Uh, this was particularly uh, a consequence of the fact that cabinet ministers 
had an average lifespan under the re-administration of about six months. Uh, and as new, new executives came in, there were frequent reshufflings of officials uh, that were at, in career ranks. Uh, but in the Office of General Affairs, we had people who uh, served uh, for several years, upwards of five to seven years. Uh, just to give you an example, one of the longest tenured uh, bureaucrats that I looked into was a man named Kim Young Jun, who was appointed to the Office of General Affairs in 1953 uh, and served all the way until early 1962. So for those of you who, uh, who are counting, that means he served through uh, three different presidencies and three two different, con no, sorry, three different constitutional uh, revisions, uh, which was highly unusual. Another unique aspect of this office in particular was that they promoted, tended to promote internally. Um, as I mentioned before, with all of the frequent cabinet reshuffles that happened at the time, uh, there, were, there was lots of movement between cabinet ministries uh, among career personnel, as well as politically appointed officials. Uh, but here, uh, just to give an example, the man I mentioned before, Kim Young Jun, uh, started out as a, a section chief, moved up to a deputy position, and then by the 1960s was appointed uh, to a bureau chief position uh, within this, all within the same agency, which was fairly unusual at the time. Um, what was not particularly unique about this agency was that they had low political influence. Um, I did, as I mentioned before, the head of the uh, Office of General Affairs was a career, um, always a career bureaucrat who was essential, whose essential function for the government was to take down the minutes for cabinet meeting, uh, cabinet meetings. Um, this was always a career position, uh, but one of the consequences of the constitutional revision that happened in the early 1950s that allowed Singman Rhee to run for uh, additional uh, additional presidencies. Uh, was the removal of the office of the prime minister. Originally, this office was part of the, the portfolio of the office of prime minister. But when that position was removed, this effectively became an independent agency that no longer had any uh, significant representation on the cabinet itself. So decisions that happened, uh, policies essentially were being dictated to this agency rather than them being a locus for the execution of uh, or the development of actual policies. Um, another interesting point to note is that they had a very broad mission, uh, in addition to things that I mentioned before about personnel administration, uh, cabinet meeting, me meeting minutes, uh, they were involved in a lot of other things around, uh, different types of, uh, uh, physical administration, things having to do with, um, sort of building maintenance, uh, and a lot, a wide range of project, uh, projects within the government, but they had an incredibly small staff. Uh, the picture you see here uh, constitutes about half of the staff. I think there's a, just a little bit more that got cut off in this picture uh, in 1957. And it really didn't extend much past this, uh, about 50 or so. At its height in about 1959, I think there were about 75 people. Uh, and most of those were people who were brought on as a consequence of trying to, uh, uh, the institution of the uh, Civil Service Pension Act which uh, required more people to process a significant amount of paperwork as a result of that. Um, another interesting fact to note here is that uh, I found evidence from several South Korean bureaucrats at the time who referred to this as a location where careers went to die. Um, this is somewhat of a pejorative, um, and I'll argue that this was not in fact the case for most of the people who were working here. Uh, but as a result of the way civil service protections worked at the time, uh, it was still incredibly difficult to outright fire someone. Uh, and so frequently underperforming civil service officials were rotated around to agencies where they would no longer be seen or heard. Um, and some of the offices within the Office of General Affairs were a pretty good location to send someone if you didn't want to hear or see from them again. But as for the Office of General Bu uh, Affairs bureaucrats themselves, they were an interesting group of folks, uh, particularly those who were in the uh, mid to upper level leadership positions. These were mostly, mostly mid-career bureaucrats, middle-aged men. Um, and because they were mid-career, that meant that most of them had gotten their start in government service under the Japanese colonial administration. Um, interestingly, uh, in for most of these uh, men, that meant actually that they started in uh, the administration in Manchukuo, 
which had some unique aspects from the rest of the Japanese colonial empire um, that will actually come into play into some of the strategies that they used uh, to effect civil service reform that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, notably, things like going through a highly regimented and centralized uh, civil service training program, and an emphasis on merit appointments through competitive examination, uh, and a relatively high level of uh, relatively high level of autonomy, particularly for local officials. Many of them also uh, participated in UN-sponsored trips to the United States uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Uh, visiting places like uh, the United States Civil Service Commission um, and various state government civil service commissions. Um, and they were also deeply engaged in a broader public administration community that was developing in South Korea at the time. Uh, when the Korean Public Administration Association, sorry, the yes, the Korean Public Administration Association was first formed in the mid-1950s at the first meeting. The Office of General Affairs sent about 10, 10 of its staff to that first meeting, which represented the largest single organization that was in attendance at that meeting. Um, they wrote uh, quite frequently in period journals uh, like Koshige and Popjong, uh, talking about discussing issues surrounding uh, personnel issues uh, and uh, personnel policy. Um, and they were, you know, generally involved in a lot of the debates. Uh, both uh, across government and in uh, in academia at the time, around modernizing civil service administration uh, in South Korea. And from the writings, it's clear that most of them adhered to the general, the popular principles of scientific management at the time. Uh, these were emphasizing things about developing efficiency within, in government, professionalizing the civil service, uh, and sort of small d democratic principles particularly things like merit appointments, um, promotion by merit, uh, and opening opening up the government service to a broader range of people who had uh, who were considered uh, suitable for those positions based off of their uh, their experience. So just to give an indication of what these men then were up against, uh, the civil service in as it existed during the First Republic under the Sigmund Rhee administration was kind of at a historical nexus in the 1950s. Um, it was very much still under the influence of a, a long lasting colonial legacy from the Japanese, um, both in terms of the personnel who were working there, many of whom had gotten as the Office of General Affairs itself was an example, had gotten their start uh, as officials within the Japanese colonial government in the in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, but also uh, the sort of long lasting norms and uh, norms and systems that had been set up during that period really didn't go away that easily, uh, particularly in the 1940s, but even well after the Korean War. At the same time, during the Allied occupation of Korea in the, 19, the late 1940s, um, the Americans had been very insistent on setting up a system of sort of American inspired civil service laws and policies. So for example, uh, they had set up rules and regulations about reestablishing a civil competitive civil service examination and having people appointed from that uh, exam, um, setting up uh, an American style job classification system, policies for equal pay for equal work, um, a variety of uh, sort of what we would consider sort of new deal type uh, civil service policies that were uh, enacted in a lot of uh, countries in the, in the West at the time, but particularly in the United States. Uh, but at the same time, Cold War politics was going on. Um, even under the occupation, the sort of practicalities and ideological tendencies of the American occupiers meant that uh, a lot of the laws and policies that they put in place were never followed. Uh, so for example, the civil service exam was instituted in the late 1940s um, and was established as law under the South Korean constitution. Uh, but in practice, hardly anybody uh, ever appointed any uh, was appoint hardly anyone was appointed from the civil service exam list, and most were appointed through a, a separate and easier to use screening system. Um, ideological issues also became uh, an important factor in how the bureaucracy had developed at the time, uh, both in terms of what types of ideological people with what types of ideological beliefs had been purged both prior to the Korean War 
during the Korean War as a consequence of it, and then uh, immediately after. So there was this really interesting confluence uh, that's coming together here that created a, a variety of interesting contradictions that the people in the Office of General Affairs were really trying to deal with. Uh, so there's sort of the tension between merit appointments and a spoil system where people were being appointed uh, in a rather arbitrary fashion at the, the whims of the appointing official themselves. Um, a, a tension between what ostensibly should be a position bound by duty to the state, but because of the financial constraints and the lack of benefits really uh, created a survival mindset that was con really conducive to, to corruption at the time. And an interesting tension between status, you know, at the, in Korean history, throughout Korean history, um, civil service positions had held a fairly high status, were considered a fairly high status position. And this was still the case uh, at the time in the 1950s. Uh, but in actuality, the power level that civil servants uh, were able to exercise by this period uh, had really been significantly reduced in favor of an increasing power of, uh, of political parties um, and political, uh, po politically appointed officials. So this was sort of the situation that they found themselves in. Um, and there's been an argument that has gone uh, on largely since the, un gone unchecked largely since the 1960s that the South Korean officials who were faced with these hurdles really never sought to challenge them or initiate any kind of civil service reforms on their own. Um, but what I'm going to argue now is that they were the people in the Office of General Affairs were effectively, as one American aid official put it in the late 1950s, the quarterbacks of uh, civil service reform in the late 1950s. Um, this is where the sort of audible mention comes in. I'm going to go through three different cases where they, uh, so to speak, tried to call a new play uh, and carry out some sort of reform that is pushing in the direction of these kind of uh, scientific management reforms that they were hoping to achieve. So I've named these three uh, after a couple of uh, football plays, if anyone happens to be familiar with any of them. Uh, the first one is one I'm calling the end around. This was a, a process of reform that they tried to enact through creatively through layoffs. So in 1956, when the budget was being formed, uh, part of the negotiation that had been put in place with, uh, a, uh, with public officials before this was that in turn for getting a significant increase in raises, uh, about a, I believe it was a 100% increase in uh, government salaries across the board at the time. So that that increase would have to come with significant layoffs from within the civil service uh, positions. So the budget called for the reduction of 11,000 permanent and 15,000 temporary positions. Uh, but what's interesting is that the budget didn't really lay out specifically how this was going to be carried out. And so the Office of General Affairs was tasked with the process of putting together guidance for agencies on how these layoffs were going to happen. And what's interesting is looking at how the Office of General Affairs set up specific categories for determination and exemption and how the categories they used give an interesting hint of the type of government that they were trying to achieve uh, kind of as an end around, so to speak, uh, through this process of layoffs. So for example, some of the categories that were set for termination were anyone who had been put under disciplinary action in the past. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, anyone who was incomplete screening. So that these are people who were coming into the uh, uh, into their position through a, a screening system. Essentially, they provided uh, a series of paperwork uh, along with their resume that officials within the Office of General Affairs would go through, make sure and make sure that they met the minimum qualifications for that position. Um, there was sort of a math calculation that went along with it. Um, so anyone who had not completed that process by this time would then be set for termination. Uh, indefinite people who were on indefinite leave or so-called in on-call officials. Um, this was an interesting consequence of, uh, as I mentioned before, the fact that it was relatively difficult to term to um, terminate regular employee uh, civil service employees at the time. Uh, so 
frequent one of the other frequent avenues for getting rid of people was to put them on on permanent leave. Um, and so those were some of the people who were set to be uh, terminated. People who are over the age of 55. Um, this is an interesting one in particular when you consider that by this time, the civil service pension system had not yet been established. Um, so uh, the there was at this time no, I believe, no set uh, maximum age limit for civil servants. Um, and the justification behind this um, is a little hard to parse out. But one of the sort of implications that I was able to see was that um, this was a, an idea to sort of rejuvenate the rejuvenate the civil service and allow them to bring in new newer and younger people and particularly kind of get rid of some of the some of, some of the government officials who were really still entrenched in that sort of colonial mindset and that colonial experience that they had been through in previous generations. Uh, and then the final category was those who had substandard work performance. The people who were set for exemption is also pretty interesting. Um, those who had irre irreplaceable skills makes sense. Uh, another one was anyone who had passed the civil service exam. And uh, coming from modern, uh, like sort of a modern perspective, this doesn't really make that much sense. But when you consider that the fact that uh, around the, around 1956, I think the statistics I have are from 1954 or 55. I think it was about only about 7% of the South Korean bureaucracy had gotten their appointment through civil passing the civil service exam. So the vast majority of people uh, did not uh, would not have met this criteria. Uh, anyone who had graduated from the National Officials Training Institute, um, this was a central uh, civil service training institution that I'll be talking a little bit more in one, one of my additional case studies. Um, but just to say anyone who had gone through that centralized training program was exempt. Uh, and then anyone who had gone on a United States uh, or a UN sponsored overseas mission. Uh, incidentally, uh, just looking through this list, you find a lot of exemptions that qualify the uh, people from the Office of General Affairs themselves, which is perhaps not surprising. The actual results of this, however, were quite interesting. Um, as I mentioned before, the Office of General Affairs had very little, uh, very little effective power within the government. So, despite the fact that they were tasked with setting up these these uh, policy, these regulation or policy recommendations, um, they really didn't have the authority to execute those or require ministries to execute those in the way that they had laid out. So, from the statistics that I've been able to gather, of the eleven thousand uh, uh, civil servants, permanent civil servants who were laid off. Uh, roughly, I think 70% of those were local officials, uh, primarily sort of local administrators as well as police officers. So there's little indication to show that uh, sort of the guidance that they had recommended about disciplinary action, civil service, all of that was really, uh, really carried out. Um, so this is an example of uh, sort of an attempt that they made. But again, the lack of power didn't uh, didn't allow them to actually follow through with it in a particularly effective way. So moving on to the next one, I'm calling the two point conversion. Uh, this was an interesting and creative attempt to reform the government through a program for administrative probationers. Um, another way to sort of think of think of the pro administrative probationers is kind of like an internship program. So. From 1956 to 1958, they had this administrative probationers program, which encouraged the appointment of uh, civil service exam passers uh, to positions within various government ministries. Uh, but these were not permanent positions. So anyone who was selected for this program could, would go through a uh, three month in service training program that the Office of General Affairs administered, where they would learn a variety of tasks uh, or a variety of sort of tasks and principles and learning how to become pr practical civil servants. What are the actual uh, actual tasks that they're required to carry out during the day, learning about paperwork, all of those, uh, learning how to write sort of white papers and things like that. Um, and part of this was in response to the complaints of a lot of uh, hiring officials within various ministries 
who would say, well, we have these civil service ex exam passers who are really good at passing tests and they're really well educated, but they don't actually know how to do any work. Um, so they would go through this insert three month in-service training program, and then they would go through a one year practical training at these various ministries. Um, so they would have a, a basically a low level appointment doing a bunch of various clerical duties uh, with the expectation, but not guarantee at the end of that, that they would have a full civil service appointment uh, to that agency or another agency. Um, the program was really popular in its first year in 1956. Uh, there were 400 candidates who applied for it and 120, 120 of them were selected. Uh, but the problem was that there were, there were a couple of problems with it. One was that because these were not official civil service uh, appointments, they didn't receive any of the regular civil service protections, uh, and they also didn't qualify for full civil service pay scales. Uh, so the pay was actually quite low. Um, and then the other part was that because agencies were not uh, uh, were not required to appoint them at the end of the year, um, a lot of agencies tended to uh, ministries tended to use this as just sort of an excuse for one year of relatively cheap labor uh, that they could then you know move off and uh, not be required to sort of fill the position uh, with that civil service exam passer. So by the second year, there was still quite a bit of demand from candidates. There were 325 people who uh, who applied for the program, but only 30 of them were actually selected. And by 1958, the program itself was canceled and really kind of uh, from the perspective of the, uh, the upper level executive policymakers, it was considered largely a failure. Um, so again, we see an example of how these Office of General Affairs uh, bureaucrats were trying to use the tools that were available to them to incentive, uh, create sort of a carrot for uh, these various ministries to start uh, creating a situation where they would want to hire civil service exam passers, um, responding to some of their criticisms and, and developing a, a broader system that would try and change these norms um, in a more positive direction per se uh, than the previous example of trying to sort of use the stick. So the third example I'm calling the Minnesota shift. Uh, this was a pilot executive training program that was established in the new National Officials Training Institute. So uh, in 1957, uh, the University of Minnesota expanded what was a pre-existing contract with the South Korean government uh, facilitated, facilitated through uh, the um, I'm drawing a blank, the precursor organization to USAID um, to uh, expand that contract to add a public administration uh, aid portion. Um, two, there were two facets of the public administration contract. The first that's much more well known is that this was uh, helped facilitate the establishment of a graduate school of public affairs at Seoul National University. But the less well-known aspect of this was the revival of the National Officials Training Institute. Now, I kind of alluded to this institution before. The National Officials Training Institution started in 1949 uh, as a central training uh, institution for South Korean civil servants. Um, it was not open for very long before the Korean War started. Um, and the Office of General Affairs uh, bureaucrats that I've been talking, I was talking about before, had at various times after 1953, tried to revive this program. Um, they'd had uh, a few different types of classes that they were trying to administer uh, at the very basic level for uh, sort of secretarial duties, um, for uh, also for human resources type, uh, human resources uh, officers. Um, but for, by and large, their, their target audience for this were um, new and sort of uh, lower level uh, South Korean bureaucrats within the system. When, uh, so part of this contract was uh, the, provided a significant amount of uh, foreign aid to help revive both the program and provide more uh, uh, resources to actually rebuild, reconstruct classrooms, provide them with uh, additional uh, and modern materials and facilities. 
Um, and so uh, along with the contract came uh, a, an advisor who was named Edwin R. Dreheim. Uh, Dreheim was an interesting character. Uh, he was originally involved in agric the agricultural extension movement uh, during the New Deal era. Had worked uh, in the US Department of Agriculture as uh, a training officer and had really helped uh, spearhead the uh, advancement of in-service training within the US Department of Agriculture. Um, and it was really kind of, the USDA itself was really kind of ahead of the curve at the time in emphasis on training uh, before uh, even the United States uh, had established the government of, uh, get a government, uh, oh, now I'm blanking on what GET, GETA stands for. Uh, the the US law require uh, establishing in-service training and emphasis on uh, modern training within the civil service. Um, so he came to South Korea in 1957, um, uh, fully intent on sort of coming in and reviving this program and really trying to modernize the South Korean civil service. Uh, and he worked very closely with the officials at the Office of General Affairs on this. Uh, and very soon after meeting with them and uh, meeting with the government, uh, the higher level policy officials, uh, the politically appointee, political appointees, uh, discovered that all of his grand plans were not going to come to fruition as easily as he suspected. Um, there was a general uh, reticence among the uh, policy making officials at the time, the political appointees, to really do, mu do much with training, particularly beyond what was uh, provided for within the, uh, within the contract. And uh, so uh, he had also been very, uh, really heavily pushing them to make some sort of policy statement, uh, whether it was through the budget, uh, the budget statement that was published in 1957 uh, or an official cabinet policy around uh, emphasis on in-service training. Uh, but he really couldn't get very far with this. Um, and so worked with the officials in the Office of General Affairs to sort of take a different tactic on this. Um, one of the, So what they ended up uh, coming up with was launching an executive development sem seminar that they would pilot uh, and then sort of use that pilot as a launch pad for expanding the... Uh, programs of in-service training within the South Korean government more generally. Uh, so the idea behind this was to uh, create this seminar that was emphasizing things like management principles, practical using practical methodology, emphasizing sort of new practices that were uh, coming about in uh, public administration education in the United States around using case studies um, and developing things like leadership skills. Uh, whereas, you know, sort of past training programs at the Office of General Affairs had sort of emphasized more clerical duties. These were really emphasizing a more broader range of philosophies and pe uh, pedagogical methodologies. Um, and, and the other interesting aspect of this too, and one that was quite strategic, was that they were targeting executives. Past attempts at the by the Office of General Affairs had, as I mentioned, sort of focused on sort of lower level bureaucrats, but by targeting the executives themselves, um, the idea was that they would establish, help them establish uh, new norms and systems that could then sort of be prop propagated downwards. Um, and the other as the and the other side of that being that by getting some of these executives on board with this new training program, it would facilitate uh, the expansion of the policy more broadly, as these executives would then sort of both bring these new concepts back to their agencies, but also facilitate discussions within the cabinet about making a broader statement about in-service training. So they ran the program in 1958, and there was an aggressive lobbying campaign that they went with this. Uh, this included not just inviting uh, high-level cabinet ministers uh, to some of these meetings, uh, it also involved uh, radio, radio spots that they would send out so that uh, they invited newspaper journalists to all of these seminars to take lots of photos. Um, they invited foreign officials to come and observe. Um, so it was a very broad campaign. Um, the program itself was quite successful. All of the participants in this program who uh, 
generally were uh, uh, bureau chiefs and uh, directors and bureau chiefs within different government agencies, uh, gave it glowing reviews. Um, one review in particular mentioned the fact that this was something that they wished that had been established in Korea for decades before. Um, and the second part of, uh, and so as a consequence of that, um, they sort of expanded that lobbying campaign even more, trying to get other uh, members, uh, uh, other cabinet ministers involved in trying to expand uh, training programs within their agencies. Um, and then also expanding the executive uh, development seminar uh, to include uh, more middle management. So for example, uh, uh, a program for section chiefs. So the section chiefs program was expanded in 1959. Uh, and by 1960, it had been so successful that there were actual statements included in the annual policy uh, budget uh, budget for emphasizing in-service training and providing additional fundi funding to ministries, cabinet ministries to establish these programs themselves. So that's an example. I the most successful example of the sort of most successful uh, program that they were involved in. But where does this leave us? Uh, I've sort of left us off at 1960 quite intentionally. Uh, after the revolution uh, in 1960, things got a little bit interesting. Um, many of the officials that I talked mentioned before, like in particular uh, Kim Yong Jun, uh, stayed on after uh, after the revolution under the Changmyeon government, um, and some were even promoted. Uh, and they attempted to continue a lot of the momentum that they had been building in the late 1950s, uh, particularly uh, surrounding the, the aid contract, um, and actually get concrete le legal changes, uh, specifically surrounding the official, uh, official appointment law to emphasize that, uh, or to actually declare that civil service exam would be the exclusive uh, avenue for appointing officials. Uh, this got all the way until April of 1961, when they were about to promote it. Uh, and then there was another revolution or a coup d'etat. Um, and so that sort of put things off additionally. Um, and so it, the legacy is somewhat interesting in that it conti they continued to work on these uh, programs, but the successive fluctuations in, uh, in government never really meant that those limitations that they faced were never completely gone. Um, and interestingly, by the early 1960s, when the military came in, uh, a lot of these officials were, were in fact eventually purged. But what's, so what's interesting to me from a policy perspective, we can really see that they weren't particularly successful in establishing new uh, concrete policies, uh, legal changes, or uh, you know, really molding the government structure on paper. But from an institutional perspective, by the late 1950s, they were really actually beginning to have an interesting influence on the civil service itself from the perspective of things like norms uh, and informal systems of uh, informal systems of operation. So just to give uh, just to give an example of this, uh, as I mentioned before, in the early 1950s, the the number of uh, civil servants who were appointed from the examination list was about seven percent, and by but by I think it was nineteen sixty one that number had increased to somewhere around I want to say sixty or seventy percent, um, and also uh, the the other aspect of this you know is in service training which was something that they had really had success with late in the period. Um, really continued to thrive in South Korean government uh, well into the 1960s and even into today. Uh, the National Officials Training Institution um, still exists now. It's under a different name, uh, but it's uh, very much become a, a part of South Korean bureaucracy. Um, and in fact, uh, something I'm sort of trying to develop a little bit more in a comparative perspective is, uh, from my perspective, was actually a bit ahead of the curve, uh, even for uh, among other Western bureaucracies at the time. Uh, the Executive Management Conference for ex uh, uh, seminar, for example, uh, the United States really didn't 
uh, institute one of uh, a similar type of system until uh, late in the Kennedy administration, I want to say. Um, and it wasn't firmly established in law, I think, until 19, the early 1970s. Um, so some interesting legacies uh, of this. Uh, and it's definitely, I think, a, an area for more research. Uh, but I will leave it off here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for giving this wonderful talk. And uh, so let's uh, give another uh, round of a big applause to Rolf. And uh, so much, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful work with us about the uh, bureaucratic reforms and changes that happen in a way that kind of, yeah, yeah, slips out of our kind of yeah, attention, especially when we are mostly focusing on the development of st state, uh, economic policy or military regimes, uh, things that change transformations that were happening under current, that what we considered as under current was in fact a more kind of institutionally impactful kind of transformation. So uh, uh, we'll have about 30 minutes of question and answer time. Uh, so for the audience, if you have any questions, you can uh, use the raise hand function to uh, uh, to ask those questions. Once then I see those uh, uh, hands icons next to your name, I will call out your name and ask you to unmute yourself and uh, and start asking uh, uh, stating the questions. And another way to do this is by uh, typing your question in the chat box. Uh, if you type that, I will read uh, read it out loud for the audience, and um, I will ask the uh, the speaker Rolf to the ask uh, answer those questions. So I will organize these questions uh, in order and have uh, uh, Rolf to answer in order. Uh, so uh, let's see. We have a question from Donna Reiner. So uh, please uh, unmute yourself and. Okay, just mm -hmm. as a um, uh, clarification, I happen to be Rolf's aunt, but um, my my interest is when do we start seeing more women in the civil service? That's a great question. Um, there, so I gave you the let's see the photo I have here. Um, I don't have statistics for you. None of the women are in this photo. I do have one that I can find that have the women who worked in the office. Uh, but generally speaking from the rosters that I looked in, at least in the Office of General Affairs, most of the women were in in sort of clerical, uh, what at the time would have been considered secretarial positions. Um, I, I'm unsure at which point they sort of, uh, they're generally promoted into more um, senior positions. Uh, I would I would say that even in the South Korean government today, there are not as many of them as there could be. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, thoughtful question. I, I'm I'm also really curious to hear about that. I when I teach modern Korean history to uh, U.S. students, what they are always fascinated was the first female president in South Korea. I don't know why, but they are really kind of interested in the story about uh, about that behind that woman. Although I tried to kind of emphasize that you know, she was the, the daughter of the strong man, the military dictator, but that didn't really work. So there's a really interesting vibe here. Uh, so uh, thanks for that question. And uh, next question is from uh, Joseph Seely. So yeah, please unmute yourself and yeah, let us know your question. All right, hello. Um... Thanks, Rolf. It's good to see you again. Um, good to hear from your research. Hope you and your family are doing well. Um, so I have two questions, if that's right. Um, first, I want you to speak a little bit more. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about this question of colonial legacies. Um, and because you have, of course, the, 
the impact of the Japanese empire and Japanese imperial practice. And then you have what could be called American imperial practice when it comes to shaping the South Korean bureaucracy, right? Um, but as a, someone, a scholar who's written about the colonial period, I'm particularly interested in what the kind of colonial legacies are. Um, and the Manchukuo, I know we both share an interest in like Manchukuo. Uh, if you could say more about how the Manchukuo experience of these bureaucrats might be um, shaping their careers um, in South Korea, post-Korean War. And then the second question is more just thinking about when I teach modern Korean history. I mean, um, kind of like Sean was talking about his own teacher's experience in the classroom. When I teach modern Korean history, I feel like the kind of image I give of 50s, 60s South Korea is, oh, you know, the, the, the Simon Rhee period, it was kind of known for corruption and cronyism. And then Park comes to power and he's a military strongman and there's human rights abuses, but things seem to also function better, you know, and South Korean economy at least improves. And so from the, pers from the perspective of bureaucratic practice in some of these offices, do you, do you feel like that's an unfair characterization that, you know, these re-bureaucrats are like trying their best and there's just these other forces, or do you think they're, you know, there's a shift as well going into the 60s and 70s. So that's like my second question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you for those questions. Um, yeah. As far as colonial legacies, um, I probably didn't highlight this quite as much as I could have in the presentation. But so, um, so like that last example of the National Officials Training Institute, um, they were quite a in terms of the content, there wasn't that much carryover from sort of the training program that a lot of these men had been through in Manchukuo that I mentioned, uh, which was much more sort of, especially by the time that most of them were in it, much more regimented, much more militarized. Um, uh, but the program that they ran in the 1950s was a lot closer to what we would think of as, as, an, of an, as an executive management seminar today. Um, but the, the sort of concept of emphasizing in-service training, pre-service training and in-service training um, was really, I think, something that was kind of pioneered in, in Manchukuo, particularly within the Japanese empire. Um, and I think it had a really significant impact on these Korean men who had gone through that program uh, to the degree that, you know, training was a very important part of how they conceived of developing these norms within the bureaucracy and what made a modern bureaucracy modern uh, was that, you know, it's not just simply, you know, I, I am an elite official who, you know, I passed all these exams and I come in and I know what I'm doing. It was, I have a job that has specific sets of duties and I am qualified for that job because like, this is, I know how to do that job, right? It's like you actually have the skills to do it, a more practical uh, understanding of what qualifications are. Um, so I think that's that's like a big part of the legacy to me. Um, they were really interested in trying a whole lot of other policies that really never got off the ground, um, that were really inspired, I, I consider inspired by, by Manchuko. One was uh, a... Um, several of them really wanted to uh, rotate bureaucrats around in different positions, particularly rotating people between local administration and central administration, which had been sort of a core principle of the Manchukuo bureaucracy, um, partly as a way of maintaining security control over bureaucrats at the time. They didn't want people out in the hinterland for very long uh, and, you know, sort of go native or get corrupt uh, and bring them back to the central uh, every once in a while. But they were really interested in sort of that concept of rotation um, and even sort of the, the odd knockoffs of the, the, the structure itself, um, this concept of the office of general affairs is a very sort of Japanese style colonial way of handling central administration for bureaucracies. Um, there were similar structures that existed both in Manchukuo and in the Japanese empire at the time, uh, in the 1940s around, you know, how public administration would function. Um, so I think all of these came into play um, in, a, in a variety of different ways. Uh, as far as the, the question about sort of the unfair characterization of the 1950s is like broadly corrupt. Um, it, it's kind of a hard question to answer, especially because I think if you ask these officials themselves, uh, 
they would say absolutely it's corrupt. <laughs> um, you know, this is precisely what they were sort of trying to, to challenge at the time. Um, but what I think, what's interesting to me and, and what I've really kind of been trying to do with this project and um, really the sort of latter half of my dissertation is to talk, is I think by diving deeper into some of these administrative institutions and looking at the people who were actually in them, you know, people didn't just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, ah, the government's corrupt. What are you going to do? Um, you know, they were, they were actual people who were serving in positions in government who were looking at the, the current situation and were actually trying to come up with creative ways to fix the current situation. Um, and so I, what I do think is an unfair characterization is to say, you know, the military just simply came in and cleaned everything up in the 1960s. Um, like they kind of did, but there was a whole lot going on that there was a whole lot going on before then that they were able to tap into. And a lot of the initial support that they were able to get, particularly within uh, among bureaucrats themselves was among these people who had been saying, yeah, we've been trying to push for this for years. The irony also is uh, that I, I found evidence that even like within those first couple of years uh, before Park Chung Yi officially became president, um, they had attempted to to do some things that you know would be considered sort of standard progressive modernization programs for the bureaucracy that the military just said no to. So, like for example, um, Kim Young Jun, who I've mentioned a couple of times. Uh, I have uh, some meetings, uh, some uh, notes from when he went to the, I, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the, the military sort of junta organization that was uh, established in 61. Um, anyway, he went to the generals basically to say, hey, we wanna establish um, an oath of office for, for civil servants because none had existed um, and he'd actually been pushing for this all throughout the 1950s. He wrote an article in 1953, uh, 54 saying, you know, we should really have this oath of office. Everyone should swear allegiance to the, to the nation when they become, uh, when they become an official. And so he brought this to the generals and the generals just said, yeah, we don't need it. It's not important right now. Um, which, you know, I think was a really interesting indication of the fact that the, the military had its own agenda and cleaning up the government was uh, a politically important part of that. Uh, but the extent that they were willing to go um, varied given the during uh, based on the conditions. Um, and I think it was partly a process of adaptation um, sort of in communication between as the military adapted to working with the civil administration um, that really didn't solidify for the first few years of the of the um, military regime. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And next question uh, will come from Sushan Wang. And uh, I remember that you also had a question in the chat box. So uh, yeah, if you please, yeah, you can also yeah ask uh, that question too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we need to uh, go back because I think uh, Rolf sort of answered it just now. You know, I was asking about the role of the bureaucrats in the 1960 revolution and their positionality as a group vis-a-vis uh, -vis the events of the April Revolution. Uh, but I think related to that question, and, and this is sort of um, actually in response or inspired in part by Joseph's question and Rolf's response to it, is that it occurred to me that, you know, seeing this level of granularity about bureaucratic reform um, makes me wonder if we should not ask other kinds of questions about the April Revolution, right? Um, so this is borrowing a little bit uh, about the debate and the um, sort of reaction to current events um, in Ukraine and Russia and uh, all this talk about oligarchs and what the post-Soviet political economy looks like, the problem of um, having counter elites within sort of autocratic regimes and how that it, it creates a dilemma where, um, you know, in the post-Soviet uh, collapse uh, period, you know, there's this... Um, you know, question of, okay, if you support the intelligentsia or do you want the nomenclature to be in charge? Uh, if the bureaucracy is too strong, it becomes like this, or do you want to support the party? And, and you know, choices in political economy, um, if you enrich, if you grow the economy, right? If you 
invest in a certain sector, you create uh, the potential for a counter elite. And, and that was sort of the dilemma of Perestroika, where you know, you're empowering one group, and by empowering one group, you destabilize the sort of political arrangement. Right. And and what we see here is, you know, I think from Rolf's analysis is that there is this concerted effort to, you know, strengthen or invest or do something with the bureaucracy. Right. And, and this is maybe soul centered. And, and, and I think, you know, uh, as you responded, is that there is this concern about can the bureaucracy itself be loyal to the state? But I think there's a, you know, maybe an economic side to this as well is that the, you, you're in a way you're creating a new social class. Right, because yes, there are continuities with the colonial period, but but you know the the upper echelon of the uh, Japanese government uh, is gone. Right, they're not uh, now. You have you're creating a new kind of Korean um, political uh, I don't know uh, pillar, if you will, in in Korean society uh, after you know the after the Korean War, and this is creating sort of. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about the spirit to say anything responsible, but but kind of new energies, right? And and uh, and I think the the political agitation, the the criticism of of uh, what is it, the uh, of corruption and and the question of you know can you advance within the system? You know, there is a counter elite, right, that is created in this process that um, you know feeds into April uh, 1960. And and I'm sort of just thinking aloud here, but it, it it seems like you know in part this explains the failure of 1960, right, uh, for democratization, because uh, I mean you know I don't know what you, what you might think, but is it um, you know the you know the energies that supported 1960 uh, that might have ousted us in memory was also one that um, prepare, prepared the ground for. Um, uh, for the for the PAC um, government, because yeah, I mean, there are just like other dynamics in here that I think uh, go beyond just sort of pro democracy, uh, pro army, or conservative, liberal, etc. But but just this question of you know a new sort of power base is emerging in in this sort of developmental. I mean, even I mean, this is not quite developmental, but this new bureaucratic uh, uh, um, storyline, right? That I think is just not quite appreciated in at least the standard narrative uh, that we teach in Introduction to Korean History. <laughs> yeah. Our, uh, uh, yeah. It's interesting that you bring up the April Rev Revolution too, because like part of the thing that, that I kind of observed with a lot of these bureaucrats, particularly in this office, is that part of their, their agenda is like this dedication to political neutrality, right? They're trying to create a bureaucracy that under you know, under sort of the Western standard of Weberian standard of what a bureaucracy is, right? It is it is apolitical? It is it exists to as a function of the state, but and there are politicians that sort of make all these policies and rules, uh, but uh, they're just there to sort of help the process move along. Um, the the problem sort of becomes that as the state becomes more and more political, um, the fact that they're not choosing sides becomes a liability. Um, because all of their actions become inherently political as the as political parties sort of capture control of the state. So after the April Revolution, it's it's really strange who gets purged and who doesn't, right? Um, some of the uh, the the head of the Office of General Affairs gets uh, gets the boot pretty quickly, in part because. Uh, you know, in part because he was the one who had all the all the goods on all the politicians because he was in all the cabinet meetings, but also because like one of the things he had to oversee while he was at the Office of General Affairs was all of the work that the political parties were doing to pressure civil servants into voting for Syngman Rhee in all of the elections, which was definitely happening. Um, and so, you know, he was pretty quickly purged, but some of the other officials were not. Um, and, uh, right, like they're it, essentially the, the, the purges themselves were sort of, a, this continuation of another political act, like another political party has sort of come in, uh, and they, they just sort of enact, uh, you know, they keep some people, they keep other people. But if you look at the policies that they were actually trying to carry out under the previous administration, administration, they were really in line with what the new 
political leadership was actually trying to promote, right? These are the people who are saying, yeah, there's all kinds of government cor corruption. We're trying to change that. Um, but uh, so like there should in principle have sort of been this plat platform for collaboration and cooperation with the, with the new regime. Um, but uh, what's also interesting is for those who did carry on and continue to work in the Office of General Affairs under the Changmyung government, is that it was pretty obvious from them from very early on that they were running into the exact same problems, right? The the political officials, uh, the politicians were making decisions based off of political expediency. They were unwilling to take risks. Uh, and so, you know, they would say, oh yeah, you know, we're interested in corruption. They'd put together this task force. They'd put some people on it. They'd come up with some policies. They'd even bring in outside American advisors that would help them write new laws. They'd get feedback on them. They'd put them before the cabinet and the cabinet, like I, <laughs> they, the um, revision to the civil service appointment law got all the way to the cabinet. They got all the way to being approved. And then if you look on the minutes, they crossed out the word approved and wrote, we'll revisit this in two months. Um, so yeah, it like I I think what you're what what you're sort of alluding to is is kind of a, a similar vein, right? That there there's this creation uh in a sense, they're trying to create this new elite, but they're they're sort of dead they're their dedication to this principle of sort of a politics and trying to stay out of politics and sort of emphasize this sort of government should be rational really doesn't allow them to work very well with whatever system is being established. I mean, I, I guess to follow up on this is I, I wonder about, you know, we're looking at large numbers, right? I mean, I think the, the you saw this figure, uh, you were, it was going to be cut by 11,000, right? So that okay. means, you know, this bureaucracy, or not just the Office of General Affairs, but I guess the new sort of state bureaucracy, we're looking at, you know, potentially, you know, 30, 40,000 people, right? It, and a lot of them based in Seoul, I guess. Um, and I'm just wondering about sort of that footprint, right? Compared to, let's say, you know, as an administrative state, like compared to the colonial government. Right, where you know how many Koreans are employed in general administration of you know of the capital um, in let's say 1943, right? Versus sort of you know post Korean War, uh, you know it, you know I, I don't know like uh, is it do you think it's continuous or if it does it like kind of balloon? And I think you know depending on that, I mean you're, you're, there is like a new sort of um, I don't know, like an economic sink, right? Like there are now all these people who have sort of political um, agency, right? Even if it's kind of low level, kind of uh, routinized, um, really, you know, but but they can, there are a lot of, now a lot of people who are critical to the operation of the state that can now drag their, their feet that didn't exist before, right? So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, and, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, the the state, to my knowledge, like in terms of numbers, did not expand that much after the colonial period. Um, it, it gets a little fuzzy because certain, like under the American occupation, right, some, some state functions are taken over by the Americans themselves. Yeah. So there's sort of that aspect of personnel and some are maintained by Koreans. Um, and to a certain degree, even under the Korean War, right, the U.S. government takes over certain elements of state administration um, within Korea. Uh, I think there was a fairly significant contraction, though, as a result of the Korean War. Mm -hmm. um, and there's definitely sort of a sense, particularly in that period, like 1953 to 1957, that it's it's like it's rebuilding, but it's not expanding very fast. And a huge aspect of that is just the financial constraint of they just can't right. afford to have that many people, um, right. right? Like the, the whole impetus between most of the layoffs that happened uh, in the mid 1950s was people wanted to be paid more and they couldn't afford to do it. Right. So it was like, the only way we can do this is if we get rid of people. Um, and I would say the, from off the top of my head, memory of the numbers, like the administration in Seoul was relatively small, um, like probably smaller than you would expect. The, the vast majority of 
uh, of government officials were local officials at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the overwhelming majority of them were in the police system, right? Because uh, that was how you maintain control over the, over the parts that were not sold. Um, but be because of the way the, the state was structured, right, they were all part of this centralized administration. Um, but again, that it that's kind of a weird colonial legacy in terms of how that was administered too, but also not because the Amer the Americans kind of ran it that way. Also, there's sort of the militarist military aspect of how that um, sort of structure works too. Um, but yeah, um, it, by by like by the late 1950s, it's definitely starting to expand, and some of that is related to to being flush with cash from American aid, as that's increasing later in the decade, um, especially as the money is being used for things other than feeding the population and being moved into a broader range of actual like reform minded programs. Um, in my dissertation, I did some other work uh, looking at a, a few other agencies and programs that were working at the time. Um, and there was also sort of a, a really broad expansion, particularly after 1957 for programs um, in the Ministry of Agriculture was one that had a big boost. Um, and even in um, like industry and commerce started to have a big boost too. So, yeah. Uh, I also have a question about the sources that you use, uh, the sources that you extract the voices of these reformers, how they kind of address uh, the problems. Uh, so they try to kind of make themselves look uh, apolitical, but yeah, pointing out the problem itself is a very political action, right? Kind of taking a side that you guys are doing wrong. There's a better way to do this, whatever kind of. So it's a kind of very political situation. They're trying to kind of navigate with the kind of the personality or positions that try to kind of make them also look uh, like a very neutral in a sense, kind of Weberian kind of definition of what bureaucracy means. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious how you kind of, yeah, find out these voices in those kind of very uh, uh, supposedly dry documents. Document, they, they try to kind of minimize those kind of uh, emotional kind of outrage or, so, so you see that they have a goal, a goal of trying to make this kind of bureaucratic uh, body more efficient which means that what whatever they have is very inefficient and something that needs a kind of immediate kind of a solution to kind of overcome this. And yeah, how, how do you kind of yeah, study these kind of materials in terms of kind of finding out the, uh, I would say the true voice or the kind of the true uh, underlying motivation behind the, the words they, they use? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, it's interesting, right? So some of the source material that I use for this is sort of not mass market, but like, um, uh, what would you call it? Sort of uh, field specific journal writing, right? So I mentioned like Pop Jong was a, is a really influential journal in legal and administrative affairs at the time. Um, Koshige, which was another sort of uh, civil service focused uh, publication. There are a few others that were, that were pretty common at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, to a certain extent, they were able to get away with lobbying criticisms against the government. Um, but they all sort of tended to be around like specific tropes that were not like, not politically divisive, right? Like, uh, if you, if you went, if a government official went out and said that there was corruption within the government, it was kind of hard to argue against that at the time. Because all you had to do was open up a newspaper. In fact, all you had to do was go down the street in some cases, uh, and you could observe government, you know, official corruption was going on. Um, so, you know, it, it follows, those types of writings definitely followed certain tropes. Um, another thing that was really interesting was going to the Korean National Archives and trying to get like official documents from this agency at the time, because the, the record keeping at the time was really bad. Um, there's not a whole lot that's left uh, besides, uh, especially before about 1959. Um, you know, there's some photos, uh, there's, uh, I found a lot of resumes uh, and sort of 
appointment documents, but there's not sort of a lot of writing on like how certain policies were developed or, um, you know, what, uh, what their, what the debates were going on internally in the agency at the time from official South Korean sources. What was really interesting was looking at all of the documents that were in American foreign aid organizations, because these were people who had a lot of individual contact with people in the Office of General Affairs at the time. Um, and so, you know, I was able to find letters that they would write to these American officials, presentations that they gave to American officials. Um, and they, I probably because of the audience that they were talking to, in a lot of cases, they were a lot more open about what their issues were, they were facing within the government, uh, particularly, you know, especially talking about trying to get political appointees, get cabinet ministers, get the office of the president to agree to certain things uh, and being honest about the fact that, you know, uh, just to paraphrase one statement, I remember reading from uh, a, a diplomatic cable of an American official said he talked to one of the office of general affairs officials and he was like, yeah, the, the thing they told us is that there is absolutely no way that the current government is going to be, have an interest in addressing uh, political corruption. <laughs> Um, so, uh, that to me, was, I thought was a really interesting source in trying to sort of actually open up what their motivations were, um, and how they were, and, and sort of looking at how they were trying to deal with some of these challenges. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh. We will end the Q&A session uh, in a couple of minutes. And before that, maybe we can gather one or two more questions from the floor. So uh, here's a bit of general social history. Um, do we have a sense of what kind of social background these uh, bureaucrats are being recruited from? That I don't know. Um, it's not something that I look too deeply into. Um, but it, it would be an interesting avenue for for exploration, you definitely. Could, you, you could consult the Jokbo, consult the genealogies of these bureaucrats and see. Are they of young Van lineage? Do we see like continuities there? So, I mean, well, there's um, no, there's um, why am I saying it like on the name? At USC was at USC Huang um, Huang Gyeongmun. Yeah, his his books on the bureau, you know, and bureaucracy make the argument that there was like the Jungian, right? There was like these kind of secondary elites that really like seized power in these bureaucracies. It'd be interesting to see, like, is that continue to be true? Like, these families continue to be influential. I feel like I talked to someone who was working on, on that a while ago. I can't remember who it was, but was looking looking specifically at like trying to trace lineages from, uh, like, sort of post-war Korean bureaucrats backwards. Um, and make and see if they can we could make any inferences or any draw any conclusions from that but i don't that was probably like 10 years ago probably i will throw the last question so more kind of contemporary uh stuff uh so recently i don't know if it's still uh, there but there's a kind of huge huge kind of fever among especially young generation trying to get into the, uh, to get a government job, trying to take the civil service examinations in the current uh, South Korean government, uh, trying to pass the seventh rank Chilguk uh, Gongwon. So I, I remember seeing kind of a news uh, headline that a college graduate was applying for a seventh uh, rank kind of a government position, applying for those civil service examination, trying to pass that exam is so competitive these days that no one, yeah, even a college graduate can get in. So uh, 
with that kind of fever, uh, do you see any kind of a uh, storyline that how you ended here kind of continues that point? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, to a certain extent, right, I think this is kind of the origins of that. But like, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you know, civil service jobs, I, I think you could argue throughout Korean history have held a certain status value. Um, and to a certain extent, I, I think the period here in the 1950s was kind of a low point for that. Um, just because, uh, you know, the the practicalities of survival at the time made taking a civil service job at the time not the most attractive uh, proposition. Um, it really didn't provide you with a lot of financial, like additional financial benefits. Um, these people were definitely overworked um, and underpaid. And um, the avenues for getting a civil service position at this time period uh, were not part continued to not be open to a very broad range of society, right? So uh, to a certain extent under the Japanese colonial regime, like coming from the sort of new educated class, uh, you know, of like sort of the, the nouveau capitalist part of society that was being educated through the Japanese education system, um, you know, to a certain extent, government positions were open to that group. But even under the Japanese colonial system, like it, very few Koreans who passed the Japanese civil service exam ended up getting jobs in colonial Korea. Um, by and large, they were appointed through a completely different system uh, that was not particularly competitive. Uh, and it continued to sort of be the system of like, who you knew was how you got the job uh, in the administration. Um, uh, particularly who you knew who was Japanese, like in the Japanese administration. Um, and th that kind of continued after the war, um, you know, under the American occupation, it was pretty arbitrary. It was like the people who were making the decisions were slightly different, but the principle for getting a government job was still pretty much the same. Like it was who you knew was the way that you got that job um, or you were just like incredibly lucky. Um, and so that continued into the 1950s, even though these sort of supposedly democratic merit based systems for getting a government job were there. Um, you know, it wasn't until the 1960s that that really started to be an option. Um, and there's been there's also been some interest. Uh, I read an interesting article um, by uh, a scholar who was sort of drawing a connection between land reform and civil service exam passing rates uh, that was basically trying to show how the the economic benefits the broader economic benefits that we people were drawing in the 1950s based on land reform were providing more avenues for people to get an education and more avenues for and therefore more people to get to be able to pass the civil service exam and move into government positions um i, I think it's an interesting argument i would say that the the administrative changes that needed to happen for that to actually take place um that i sort of argue about in this presentation also were a necessary precondition for that sort of broadening of the uh, the social groups that could participate in government administration um, needed to happen first. Um, but I, you know, like I think I think this is sort of the visioning of what that would become of uh, you know making being a civil a, a bureaucrat a civil servant into an attractive uh, career path for someone uh, that, you know, anyone in principle could achieve um, was sort of kind of the the origin origin of an, a new or a reconception of that, right? Well, uh, if there's no question, maybe we can end today's uh, Zoom talk at this moment. Uh, we also have another uh, Joseon History Society team member, our director, uh, Su Xiang Wang. So uh, if you want to have a chance to kind of talk about our yeah, recent projects or... I, I'm not a director, I'm a program advisor. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 
you're right. So sometimes that's right. confused about all the, the titles that we have. But, yeah, but yeah, the bureaucracy. Indeed. Yeah, so I Indeed. guess one thing uh, I can mention is that we are going to move forward to try to incorporate uh, officially as a uh, nonprofit. I mean, it's something that we uh, have been exploring over the past uh, few months. Um, you know, uh, it's going to take a, quite a bit of work uh, because we have to work with various state and national bureaucracies to um, to get it going. But but uh, you know, it, we're going to become more official, right? So so I think this is a, uh, and that means uh, with uh, that uh, we will uh, be able to have things like finances. Um, and and then we're gonna have to uh, move forward, um, you know, uh, get together a board, advisory committee, things like that. Um, so, you know, if you or anyone you know would be interested in participating in in this sort of capacity, um, you know, you you know who to contact. You can contact Sean or me uh, or Nick Marceau and um, any of the team members, and then we can sort of discuss this as we move forward. Uh, we don't. You know, uh, the the work isn't very onerous. Um, I uh, you know, uh, as we you know, uh, in in turn in you know, we we do this on a volunteer basis. So there's no uh, we, we're unlike uh, yeah uh, the bureaucrats uh, that Rolf has talked about. Uh, we we can't do anything to you. <laughs> it, uh, you know, we can't compel um, commitment. Uh, but uh, but if you're interested, uh, do let us know. Um, another thing I, I just want to mention is that uh, if you uh, we have recently launched the translation and consultation service, which uh, is in on the Chosen History website, uh, Chosen History Society website, and if you go there, you uh, and and what this is is uh, okay. There are two ways to think about it. One is if you're doing a, a project, uh, a publication in related to Korean history, and you need help. Um, either with translation or uh, romanization, bibliography. Uh, there's a list of people who um, are offering their uh, services. Um, we don't collect any money or anything like that. Um, it's just their their profiles are there for you to contact so that you can contact them. Uh, the other thing we're doing is, of course, sharing profiles. So if you are interested in doing freelance work uh, in connection with Korean studies or Korean history, uh, you can also contact us and we can uh, put your profile on that website so that those in need of these uh, kinds of connections and uh, and uh, services can um, can reach you. So I think I'll just leave it at that for now. Oh, Sean, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I apologize for the delay. So I'd like to thank again, uh, Rolf Siversen for presenting this fascinating research. And I'd like to thank every participant in, the, uh, in today's Zoom meeting for uh, sharing your uh, thoughts and your feedback. Uh, and thank you for the generosity for uh, previous partic uh, participants. Uh, some of the talks that are given in our Zoom sessions are now available in our YouTube channel. So you can find the link in our YouTube channel uh, from the chat box. And again, yeah, uh, we thank you for your time and effort being here uh, throughout the talk and we appreciate your presence and input that help us to have this uh, interactive and dynamic conversation with Dr. Rolf Siversen and his research. We hope to see you again uh, in next month. So please stay tuned for our upcoming events. So I will stop the recording now. So thank you so much.